This is a crime uncomfortable for everyone, a callous and unfathomable act that stunned Melbourne and still leaves people speechless. In 2009, a father was driving his three children to school across the Westgate Bridge when he pulled into the left lane and turned on his hazard lights. What happened next was a crime so inexplicable and public that Judge Paul Coughlin described it as an offence against the collective conscience. A hot summer day in Melbourne and commuters on the Westgate Bridge are left stunned by a senseless act of violence. It was just too shocking, so the first instinct was not to believe it. At the centre of this appalling crime was one man, a father, and shockingly, the victim was his own daughter. When he asked Freeman what he'd done, he didn't answer, just got back into his car and drove off. And you just don't know how anyone can murder anyone, but do it to your own flesh and blood, it's just big belief. Paramedics worked for an hour at the scene, trying to revive four-year-old Darcy Freeman. That her father was involved, it automatically appalls you, and it, it's just beyond belief, really. I've been a policeman for 34 years, and, and that's as upset as I've been in terms of investigations that I've ever seen. Faced with silence from the father, questions needed to be asked. Just how could somebody commit such an atrocity? They'd gone to five different psychologists to find out why this man had acted this way. You know, was he mad or bad? I'm Stan Grant. This is the chilling story of little Darcy Freeman on crimes that shook Australia. On a hot January morning in 2009, a man drove his car to Melbourne's Commonwealth Law Courts. He carefully reverse parked, fed the meter, and then led his two young sons inside. He arrives at court, picks up his son, and says, take my child. And they have no idea what's going on. Almost catatonic was the way that I would describe him. He wasn't at all responsive clearly upset and he's standing looking out and his boys are at his feet and he's shaking and he looks like he's sobbing but you can't see his face and all his staff are milling around him and i cannot get that image out of my head the man's name is arthur freeman a 37 year old tech worker from melbourne Hours before the confusing scenes at the law courts, Arthur was preparing to drive his sons to school on their first day back from the summer holidays. Also in the car, excited about her very first day at school, was his four-year-old daughter, Darcy. It was Darcy's first, first day at school. That excitement, especially you know, in the middle of summer, a hot morning and they were coming from a family holiday so Darcy's dad was to to drop her off for school that day so there, were, there would have been that air of excitement. Darcy Freeman was four years old described by family members as a determined and strong-willed young girl she was especially close to her two brothers despite this in 2009 Darcy's family was in a state of turmoil, with her parents Arthur and Peter divorced and locked in a bitter custody battle. The day before, Freeman had had his access to his children reduced by a court. It appears that Darcy's father was quite angry about, about that outcome in, in terms of his access to his children and in terms of financial settlement. So he'd left the house and his dad had been, you're really emotional, I'll drive with you. And he'd said, no, he now has to live with not getting in that car for the rest of his life. With his three children in the back, Arthur Freeman made the 130 kilometre journey from his parents' holiday home in Aries Inlet to Melbourne. The plan was to meet his ex-wife, Darcy's mum, at the school gates so she could hand over a school uniform ready for her first day. 
he'd, he'd driven from his parents' place down near Geelong. Uh, he'd stopped the car at the, the top of the Westgate Bridge. A main commuter link from the southwest of Melbourne, the Westgate Bridge is an iconic site across the city. It's got a real history, the Westgate Bridge. It collapsed back when it was being constructed. It's certainly an icon in Melbourne and takes a whole lot of traffic uh, out to the west and from the west in, into the city every morning. So really high volume. And in the peak hour in the morning, most of that volume is coming from the west and travelling towards the city. Well, any approach into Melbourne on the aeroplane, you can see the Westgate Bridge. It always seems to stand out as a very... It covers the sort of comes across the river where the river meets the bay, so it's a very long area and it's, you know, it's, it's visible from just about everywhere in Melbourne. I don't like driving on that bridge. I've never really liked it. It's, you know, it's not a pleasant place to be. It's, you know, it's, it's high up and it's windy and you only go over, it, over that bridge when you have to. Just after 9am on the 29th of January 2009, as his children played games in the back of the car, Arthur Freeman had made a series of frantic phone calls on the 90-minute journey to Melbourne. As the temperature increased outside, so too did Arthur's stress levels. At the midpoint on the bridge, he made a decision that would have a devastating impact on the lives of so many people. He'd asked Darcy to climb into the front seat. He then carried her to the rail and threw her over the bridge. The height of the bridge is 58 metres. This inexplicable act carried out just after 9am during the morning rush hour was done in full view of commuters. Stunned witnesses called the police as many others struggled to comprehend what they had seen. So the witnesses were saying, I thought it was a doll or I don't know what I've just seen. I can't imagine how, how affected you would be. Hello, uh, I've just witnessed a man throw a child over the Westgate Bridge. Throwing a child, did you say? Yes. And a pony Some of them said that they couldn't believe what they were seeing, that they thought it must have been a teddy bear. They, they just couldn't reconcile it. The idea that you can get up and go through the motions, eat your breakfast, get in your car and drive to work, and as you're driving to work in, you know, peak hour traffic, you watch someone pull over, put their hazard lights on and throw their daughter over a bridge. You can't get much more public than driving across Westgate Bridge in peak hour traffic on a weekday in Melbourne. Uh, that's about as public as it gets, and to stop your car in full view of other drivers and, and do what, what he did. I guess just, you know, the normality of it, just driving along and to see someone stop on the bridge would have, you know, I, I, you can only imagine what they would have sort of, you know, witnessed. Moments before Arthur threw Darcy from the bridge, a truck had passed with a dash-mounted camera. There was a four-wheel drive or a truck that drove over the bridge with a, a video camera that ran on a continuous loop. And we've got his car with its hazard lights on the, on the side of the bridge pulled over, so immediately before throwing Darcy off the bridge. And I remember being really glad that he didn't actually capture that moment because it's not something that I really wanted my investigators to have to watch. As the commuters were left stunned by the events unfolding before them, Arthur Freeman quietly headed back to his car. Freeman threw Darcy off, off the bridge and then calmly got back in the car. He, he drove down and stopped at the bottom of the bridge. Her brother kept saying, you've got to go back, you've got to go back, Darcy can't swim. Not knowing that she'd fallen nearly 60 metres over the side of the bridge. Darcy can't swim, Dad. From the eyes of an innocent child, he wouldn't have understood how devastating that fall was going to be. And in his head, he knew there was water there. So, yeah, Darcy can't swim. With the police alerted, 
and the country not yet aware of the tragedy. Arthur Freeman continued to drive his two sons away from the scene, unaware his daughter Darcy, having survived the fall, fought for her life below. When police, ambulance and media first received calls to respond, they all thought there must have been a mistake. A man had thrown his young daughter off a bridge 58 metres into the water below. I think the general reaction in the newsroom was disbelief. It was a case of going, what? That doesn't sound right. And the police were saying, look, we don't know, we don't know, we can't confirm it, but that's what we're hearing. I remember getting the call that someone uh, had been thrown from the Westgate Bridge. And I remember thinking there must be a mistake. This ju just can't be right. We thought it was going to be wrong. We thought that within, a, within half an hour, an hour, it would clarify itself. Maybe it was a doll, maybe it was something else. And I thought that all the way, even driving, driving to there, I thought there, there's got to be a better explanation for this. But unfortunately, there wasn't. That's exactly what had happened. As distressing as they are, the facts are fairly straightforward that he's got out of the car, taken this young girl and, and dropped her over the side of the bridge. I think people do uh, react differently when it comes to children because of the helplessness of the children, the dependency that the children have on, on adults. And to have that violated is, uh, is horrific. When police and ambulance crews arrived at the scene, the tragedy was confirmed and everybody worked tirelessly to save the little girl who had been in the water for 15 minutes and incredibly was still alive. Darcy had been recovered from the water. I think it was the water police had a boat and, and fished her out of the water. So by then I knew what, what had happened. It was fairly chaotic. There was a lot of police there, by, both uniform and detectives and a, a whole lot of media there. Everyone trying to work out and make some sense as, as to what had occurred. Everybody was affected by it because it was so public. He'd also involved everybody else in it. He'd involved those people driving to work. He'd involved the paramedics that had to resuscitate her at the bottom. The emergency service workers and the, you know, who did everything and the, and the doctors who did everything they could to try to save her. Yeah, it's remarkable, that, that really struck me. That was a really tough job for the police and the ambulance that had got there uh, immediately. But, but at the time, you're so busy that that's not the critical time. I think people cope better when they've got tasks to do. And there was a whole lot to do in terms of Darcy and her care. As rescue crews frantically tried to keep young Darcy alive, Arthur Freeman drove to the Commonwealth Law Courts, handed over his two sons, and waited for the world to grasp the enormity of his actions. When he drove off, he drove then through busy peak hour traffic to a parked, reverse parked, and put money in the meter at a parking bay. He then walked into the federal court with his two sons and says, take my child. Police arrived at the Commonwealth Law Courts at 10.30 a.m., 90 minutes after Arthur Freeman threw his daughter Darcy from the Westgate Bridge and his boys are at his feet and he's shaking and he looks like he's sobbing but you can't see his face. Unable to comprehend the enormity of the situation, Arthur's eldest son told the court guards his parents' names. When police arrived, the two young boys were cared for by court counsellors. Arthur was conveyed back to the Homicide Squad office. Um, a tape was turned on. He, Almost catatonic was the way that I would describe him. He, he wasn't at all responsive, um, clearly upset. Um, so we had to get a forensic medical officer in to, to examine him, a doctor who, who made a determination that he was unfit for interview. In a strange way, it, it kind of came to a conclusion very quickly. It wasn't long after that that Freeman was arrested. Um, and I do remember the Premier made a, a, did a press conference that day, I guess just in a bid to sort of, in an attempt to, to put some words to what had happened to try to capture some of the grief that pe and shock that people were, were feeling. You know, I just shuddered when I heard about it. I think every Victorian, you, you, just, you just shudder, you just think, how can that happen? 
I don't think Melbourne or even Australia had seen or, or heard about something like this on this scale. With Arthur Freeman now in custody, ambulance crews had worked on Darcy for over an hour before her tiny body was transported to hospital for intensive care. She had some brain injuries, some severe internal injuries and, and, and some bruising. Um, the police that attended um, commenced CPR, as did the ambulance when they arrived, and that continued uh, until she got to hospital. As news spread of the shocking event, police had the daunting task of informing Darcy's mother, who had been waiting outside the school. There were two members of the, the homicide squad that went out to, to um, pick up Darcy's mum and take her to the hospital. Darcy had been taken to hospital, so we had some homicide squad members with her and some uniform members with her, and, and that's, that's just a really tough day at work. Darcy Freeman was flown directly to the Royal Children's Hospital, where emergency staff continued their efforts to keep the little girl alive. When Peter Barnes arrived to see her daughter, sadly, she was forced to make a heartbreaking decision. She'd had to stand there in the hospital and tell the staff to turn off her daughter's life support and that she did cradle her daughter as she died. Despite the efforts of ambulance and hospital staff, at 1.35 p.m., nearly four and a half hours after being thrown from the Westgate Bridge by her father, four-year-old Darcy Iris Freeman died. Darcy Freeman was, she was four. Um, she hadn't lived at all. It's really, any time there's young children involved, it, it, it's really difficult. Uh, and young Darcy, like, she was a young four-year-old girl, really attractive. We've all got a maternal and paternal instinct. Uh, and she's died in a terrible way, in tragic circumstances, through no fault of her own. So in some ways you shouldn't say that some murders or deaths are worse than others, but clearly these circumstances, they're really difficult to get your head around. And I've been a policeman for 34 years and, and that's as upset as I've been in terms of investigations that I've overseen. The repercussions from Arthur Freeman's actions were felt across the entire city of Melbourne. People were in shock, trying to understand how someone could deliberately harm a child in such a shocking and public way. How can a man throw his daughter 58 metres to her death? What's the explanation there? And a lot of people were saying, well, he's got to be crazy, hasn't he? As Arthur Freeman sat behind bars, legal teams and health professionals endeavoured to build a case to comprehend his actions. In 2009, Arthur Freeman killed his daughter after settling a custody dispute with his ex-wife. The incomprehensible nature of the crime and the public response was overwhelming. It was two years after the tragic death of Darcy Freeman that Arthur Freeman stood trial. He had entered a plea of not guilty. Legal teams took time to consider Arthur's psychological health, personal history, the family law court decision, family and witness statements, and every mitigating detail related to the case. The general reaction to covering that trial was people would say, so what are you covering? And you tell them, and they'd say, oh, I, I can't listen to that, I turn that off. It was people, especially people with young children, were saying, I, I turn that off when it comes on telly, I turn it off when you're on the radio, I don't listen to that. It's too upsetting. Darcy's name comes up and they, you can see the, the shake of the head, people don't want to talk about it. There was just something special about poor little Darcy, you know, and what happened to her and uh, the way it was done, it's just, uh, it just uh, it shocked everyone. As the media converged on the first day of the court case, everyone was keen to see Darcy's mother, Peter Barnes. We'd never seen Peter Barnes. We'd never seen Darcy's mum. And she lived in WA, so she'd travelled over to do this case. We were aware that that was going to be extremely confronting and that this woman was going through a lot of the time. 
There was a, a respect in the way the media reported the case and it's a really difficult situation that they find themselves in because there's a, a need for the news to get out. It's got a whole lot of public interest, not despite the fact that it's so tragic. Um, so they've got a responsibility to report on what had occurred, but they've obviously got kids and, and they obviously uh, can't be unaffected by what happened. They handled themselves really well. It was organised with the detective to ask the family if they would consider essentially reenacting a walk for us. So we agreed with Darcy's mum, Peter Barnes, that if we filmed her once, that was the shot we were going to use for the whole trial. It's extremely unheard of, but we decided that she should be given space. As the trial began, all eyes were on the man who had callously thrown his daughter from the bridge. Arthur Freeman arrived at court looking like this dishevelled, crazy guy. He had crazy hair. He was later described as a Rasputin-like mad monk kind of image that he portrayed. He was dishevelled and he just sat. I remember he sat in the dock just staring gormlessly. I don't know what explanation Mr Freeman could provide that would make any sense to, to me or, or to anybody else. A lot of people were saying, well, he's got to be crazy, hasn't he? Because in a lot of people's minds, that was the only explanation you could have. That man's mad. It's very difficult, I think, uh, very difficult for me and very difficult for a lot of people to understand why the offender would overcome all his own values and kill a child. So on the very first day it was set out, the arguments, the prosecution stood up and spoke to the jury and said, this man wasn't mad, this man killed his own daughter as an ultimate act of revenge against his ex-wife because they were going through a bitter custody battle. And so from then on, that was, that was the argument. Was he bad or mad? Arthur Freeman's ex-wife, Peter Barnes, sat in court throughout the entire proceedings, supported by her family. I don't know how a, a mother can sit through that and, and listen to, to what occurred. We were very conscious that not only was Darcy's mum there and her family. You go into court as a court reporter and you brace yourself, going, OK, you have to steel yourself against this. But that wasn't the case with Peter Barnes. She took the stand and she was stoic, she was polite, calm, firm. If he had done this to get back at her, to hurt her, which obviously he had to an extreme extent, she was not going to let him see that. She had got to that stage where she wasn't going to let him hurt her and she was quite dignified as the way she delivered her evidence and uh, did a terrific job in giving her evidence under the circumstances. As the trial continued, the defence put forward their case regarding Arthur Freeman's actions that day. The argument put forward by the defence was that he was disassociating, they called it, acting like an automaton, like a robot, like acting without conscious thought behind it. And that he did that in that split second when he threw her over the bridge. I'm not convinced that uh, people uh, offending in that manner are unaware of the wrongness of the behaviour. Well, the prosecution made a point of telling the jury that they'd gone to five different psychologists to find out why this man had acted this way. And all of them had agreed that he knew what he was doing and that he knew right from wrong when he was doing it and that his act would cause real and significant harm to his child, if not kill her. During the trial, the jury heard details about the phone calls Arthur Freeman made in the lead-up to Darcy's death. Arthur had spoken with his sister, making no reference to any pending tragedy, instead worrying about his children's school lunches and being late for Darcy's first day. Another call to a close friend in the UK 
relayed his fears about losing his kids, feeling helpless and being surrounded by angry women in the courts who were not supportive of fathers. He spoke to her of pursuing greater custody through the courts and offered no warning of the horror ahead. The call ended when her phone battery went dead. At 8.54 a.m., Arthur received a phone call from his ex-wife, Peter Barnes. She was concerned Arthur was running late to drop Darcy off. That's been the catalyst. And for some reason, that catalyst has been more powerful than their own awareness of the life of their kid. And that's very difficult to understand. As Arthur Freeman approached the Westgate Bridge, the terrifying words he uttered over the phone to his ex-wife were a forewarning to his appalling actions. The words he said to his ex-wife over the phone moments before, say goodbye to your children, that are just chilling. And they probably illustrate his intentions at the time um, and probably his motives in terms of spousal revenge. I killed the wife, it's not gonna make much difference. I killed the child, my own child, it's going to affect the mother for the rest of her life. You know, something she's never gonna get over and never will in any way, shape or form. When the defence's psychologist was saying, well, no, he was disassociating, the question put to him was, well, why did he do all those other rational things? He acted certainly like anybody else would act when they were driving in peak hour traffic. He's on a bridge in peak hour traffic, but he remembers to put his hazard lights on when he pulls to the side. If somebody is disassociating and not acting consciously, why would they do that? That's a very rational thing to do. As witnesses testified and evidence was put forward, Arthur Freeman sat silently in the dock, showing very little emotion. The pathologist came and detailed in very specific detail about the injuries that Darcy Freeman had sustained in that fall. And that was the only time that Arthur Freeman in the dock showed any emotion whatsoever. And he started to wipe tears away from his eyes. A lot of people um, uh, actually do feel remorse once they're locked up. So we go see him in the cells after they've been charged uh, or during the trial. And uh, some are actually remorseful. Few, uh, not everyone, but some are actually remorseful and contrite. And uh, if they are, it makes the job easier to be able to, to tell the judge something about them. If they're not and they come up with all sorts of weird and wonderful uh, issues of mitigation, then I hope you know, we lose them. I think most of us went to court wanting to understand how a man could throw his four-year-old child 58 metres to her death. And most people that you spoke to would say, well, he's mad, isn't he? He has to be mad. That was, that was the explanation everybody had for it, because that's the only explanation, plausible explanation people had. You, you couldn't do that unless you had lost your mind. It's not normal behaviour, it is abnormal behaviour, it's not right and it doesn't uh, fit logically that uh, in response to little blue you had with the mother of the children you go and kill the children. That's illogical and irrational. After 19 days the trial drew to a close and jurors retired to deliberate on the case against Arthur Freeman. The jury was deliberating for days and days and days and we're all waiting and it'd been about five days and they kept coming back and asking questions of the judge and it was very clear they were very confused about what they had to decide. So after about 19 days of evidence, the jury was asked to go and deliberate and decide whether Arthur Freeman deliberately killed his child or was mad. The thing that was confusing them was that they didn't seem to get, if he's not mad, then he did murder his child. They thought there was other things in between. Despite denying any memory of what he had done, Arthur Freeman accepted 
that he had caused Darcy's death. The jury had to decide if Arthur's actions were those of fluctuating madness or filicide. They were to decide whether this man was mentally impaired or whether he committed murder. But it seemed that they thought they were two separate things. So if he, was, if he wasn't mentally impaired, then they had to look at whether he'd committed murder. But it was actually very black and white. So they kept coming in and asking the judge, and the judge kept repeating it in a lot of legalese, which is their job, that's how they do it. And then they came in and told the courtroom that they were deadlocked and they couldn't make a decision. And there was women in that jury that were beside themselves, they were crying and looked very frustrated. And there was a lot of tension in that jury. You could see it because some people got it, others didn't, and, and it just wasn't working. And I just kept thinking to myself, what if they come back and find him not guilty? Arthur Freeman had never apologized for his actions never explained why he did what he did. Often reluctant to appear in court, his trial was an examination of logic. The jury had spent five days trying to understand why and was still no closer to a verdict. In 2011, Arthur Freeman faced court charged over the murder of his four-year-old daughter, Darcy. Over 19 days, the court heard evidence relating to Freeman's psychological state, and the jury were deadlocked in their decision of whether Freeman was mad or bad. It's, it's like a sense of dread, because you honestly don't know what's going to happen next. He was just a mongrel and a scumbag, and that's why he was there, and there's no other reason. The 37-year-old barrister has argued that he was mentally impaired at the time. It was about 7 o'clock, and usually jurors go home at 4.30. And the judge had said to them, no, I think you can reach this decision. I would like you to stay back. And he said it out very clearly. And in a way, dropped the legal jargon and just went, if not this, then this. And they went back, and 40 minutes later, they came back with a verdict. After 19 days of challenging evidence and five days of tense and emotional deliberations, the jury returned with a unanimous verdict of guilty. Arthur Freeman was responsible for the murder of his daughter, Darcy. I got in a cab and I burst into tears. Just a sense of relief. There was this, it was answered. The family had got their answer now. He was going to be punished for what he'd done. And I just cried, just couldn't stop crying. As the family welcomed the verdict, Darcy's mother, Peter Barnes, read her victim impact statement in court and spoke of the heartbreak of losing her daughter. I think she only started to show how upset she was when she read her victim impact statement, but that was after he was found guilty. Where to start is a challenge, as this statement brings to the surface all of the raw emotions I live with daily. The saying, time heals all wounds, is not true for myself, and I don't ever expect it to be. Not a day goes by where I do not constantly think of Darcy, where I don't miss her and wish with all my heart that she was with me. You're never going to get over it, but if you don't do something about it and move on, and that's why these things have expressing yourself in the victim impact statements are all good therapy and it's good therapy for the people to get it off their chest. No one can erase the thoughts and associated feelings I have of sitting in the hospital and having to tell the hospital staff that they were allowed to turn the life support machine off. Of holding Darcy in my arms as she passed away and knowing that this decision would take her from me again and knowing that there was no other option available to me. The sentence was aired live on radio so the community could share in the moment. The two local radio stations here decided to stream the audio of the sentence live. So people were driving around Melbourne listening to the sentence of Arthur Freeman. And I think 
the decision by the radio stations to do that was to give closure. And I think that was the right thing to do because people needed closure. The jury rejected your defence of mental impairment and once that defence was rejected, it was inevitable that you be convicted of murder. This was the killing of an innocent child. The circumstances of the killing were horrible. The throwing of your four-year-old daughter from a bridge more than 80 metres above the ground could not be more horrible. It follows that you brought the broader community into this case in a way that's rarely, if ever, been seen before. It offends our collective conscience. The big question in this case was, should he get a parole period? Which would mean that you get a life sentence, but then you would get the opportunity to apply to be released from prison after a certain period of time. It was given that he was going to get a life sentence for the murder of his daughter. You'll be sentenced to be in prison for life. I fix a period of 32 years before you will be eligible for parole. It means that the earliest date you will qualify to be released will be the 29th of January 2041, when you will be 67 years of age. That's a big whack of a sentence. We have double murderers in prison with lesser sentences than that. Well, that particular judge was very good at the sentencing and uh, so it obviously affected them as well as everyone else in the community and uh, I believe that uh, what he said was great that he said it and uh, I just wish more judges would sort of do what that particular judge did. He pointedly said a lot of people blame themselves. And then he very pointedly said, but you did this, you have to take responsibility for this. Because I can imagine all those people driving across the bridge that saw it. You know, do they replay it in their head? If I'd have rushed him, if I'd have, you know, if I'd have got out sooner, if I, if there would have been people that have passed that didn't stop at all. It just goes to show how many victims there are in this case. Her death would have affected so many people from her mother, her brothers, to Freeman's family, to Peter Barnes' extended family, to the people who witnessed what they did, to the emergency services people. I'm told that some of those guys are, are still struggling today because what I think you do is you try to make sense of something that just doesn't, doesn't make any sense and, and it's really hard to reconcile those two things. With criminal proceedings completed, Arthur Freeman sought leave to appeal his sentence, a request that was unsuccessful. Questions raised in the court case by Darcy's mother, Peter Barnes, with regards to her doctors, were then addressed in a coronial inquest to explore if any lessons could be learned that might prevent similar deaths in the future. Criminal proceedings were wound up in 2011, and it wasn't until all these years later that the state coroner, the Victorian state coroner, decided to hold an inquest into her death to examine the roles of health professionals in the lead-up. The focus was on Peter Barnes's meetings with her GPs in 2007 and 2008, um, and the, the concerns that she allayed to those doctors, um, whether those doctors acted responsibly in, in not reporting her concerns to authorities. The inquest heard details that police had attended a domestic dispute between Arthur Freeman and Peter Barnes in 2007. After seven years of marriage, Ms Barnes had expressed concerns for her children's welfare to her doctor at the time, after the police intervention. She had reported, I think, an incident where Freeman came over to her house one day and there was a wrangle over trying to get Darcy's younger brother. So police were certainly aware that, you know, of instances of, of concern. And that was actually one of the reasons why the doctors didn't report or didn't uh, disclose that information they were presented with to, to authorities because they knew that the incidents had already been reported to the police. So they were comfortable, according to their statements, they were comfortable with, with not reporting it to authorities. Satisfied that police had dealt with the details of the 2007 domestic dispute, 
Doctors stated that there were no emotional or physical indicators evident to them that Arthur Freeman was a threat to his children at the time. One doctor said in a statement that um, even in hindsight, he just had no idea that um, Freeman would snap the way he did. If they uh, indicate to me, yeah, I had woke up this morning and decided this is what I'm going to do, and some do, it is a different issue psychologically, I think. And it, uh, in my opinion, intensifies the disturbance of the perpetrator if there is premeditation. Those doctors never alerted authorities. The reason they didn't was because no one was able to really read Freeman's mood at the time. The Arthur Freeman they saw was always a man of a calm exterior. He was polite. Family violence is a significant issue, and this is the really ex extreme end of it. So we'd love to be able to stop it, but it's one of those things that you can look back in hindsight and perhaps point to indicators. Um, he was clearly upset, but the family law court stuff had been going on for some time. Um, there was nothing to indicate that he was going to do what he's going to do. In 2012, Peter Barnes took legal action against Vic Rhodes after they repeatedly ignored advice to install safety barriers prior to Darcy's death, a case that was settled out of court. The coronial inquest into Darcy's death recognised the installation of barriers on the Westgate Bridge two months after Darcy's death had a significant effect on the prevention of jumping suicides from the bridge. There had been some other instances of, of people committing suicide on, on, on the Westgate Bridge. Um, since that time, there have been some barriers that have been erected so people can no longer climb over or be thrown over the bridge. The inquest findings placed responsibility for Darcy's death solely with Arthur Freeman. His actions and Darcy's death were unable to have been predicted with any great certainty. And recommendations for the introduction of compulsory family violence training for doctors were made. There's a new push now for, for doctors to, to have increased training and to have mandatory reporting. Probably safe to say there's been a, a renewed focus on family violence issues in Australia in, in recent years. The inquest into Darcy's death came amid this time, this renewed focus. Darcy Freeman's name has become synonymous with shock and sadness, a case now etched into the psyche of Melbourne, a timely reminder of the fragility of life, a tiny face of innocence that continues to evoke difficult memories for all involved. Certainly a terrible tragedy. Um, I'd certainly go so far as to say it's something that I'll never forget, nor will any of the people that attended there on the day, and it will never, ever make any sense to me. People still talk about the Arthur Freeman case. People still talk about Darcy being thrown from the bridge. You hear people in Melbourne talk about how they drive across the West Gate, and even though we have massive security guards there now, which came about after this crime, people still picture it in their heads. It's one of those cases that still strikes a chord with people. You like to think your neighbours are people you can trust and that, you know, your kids are safe at school and that, you know, the driver in front of you won't pull over on a bridge and do something like that. He's incarcerated for, for over 30 years. There were obviously some demons there, but he's got a lot of time to reflect and think about what he did. Four-year-old Darcy Freeman's death has had a profound impact on those who knew and loved her, as well as the wider community. While the repercussions of this crime has drastically altered society, it has also strengthened and emboldened the moral fibre and the goodness that will always be there. I'm Stan Grant. Join me next time for more Crimes That Shook Australia.